Hi everyone, this is Neil Reiterter, also known as the Wax Whisperer. Thank you for joining me in my latest video. I have here yet another very interesting case, uh, and it's of a patient who suffered from an ear infection a couple of weeks ago, and they visited their GP who prescribed them oral, so systematic antibiotics, and um, they still felt blocked after their course of antibiotics, so they arranged to see myself, and as is visible, this patient's got a blocked right ear. They've got this um, occluding, really crusted uh, residual discharge from the infection, dead skin in the mix, keratin, probably some earwax as well. It looks as though it's been pushed in a little bit. Um, now, those white woolly um, features on the surface of this wax, it's not cotton wool fibres. Uh, which you could be excused for thinking there is, it's actually uh, fungi, and it's a particular strain of fungi, uh, Aspilogis. Now, th there are sub-strains of Aspilogis, for example, Aspilogis niger and Flavis, but it's not uncommon for people to develop uh, a secondary fungal infection after taking antibiotics, and the reason for that is our ears are, and most of the surface of the skin across the body, we have natural uh, native... Uh, bacteria and fungi. So you may have just seen that little piece of fleshy material that I removed. That's just granulation tissue. Granulation tissue is inflammatory tissue and it's present when you've got an infection, some healing going on. So just in case you're wondering what that was. So yeah, uh, we've got uh, what we call skin flora. We've got uh, native bacteria and fungi and viruses even living on the surface of the skin. So when you take um, antibiotics, you're not only killing the the bad bacteria that's causing the infection, but you're also uh, killing the good bacteria, uh, the native bacteria that are not really pathogenic. And so, for example, in this ear, there's no bacteria or very little bacteria, which then allows the fungi to take advantage. They've got no competition. So they can then exponentially grow and really get a stranglehold in the ear. So as you can see, that's what probably has happened in this case. So what I've managed to do so far, I've, I've cleared that occlusion. Um, there is a bit of debris around the edge and I'm going to get trying to get as much out as possible. Um, not because it's going to improve the hearing, but you can see it's infected. The more I get out, the more likely it is that I'm expelling this uh, fungi from the ear. So it gives the ear a better opportunity to heal itself. But in the distance, the eardrum itself, you've, we've got, um, it's coated with discharge ear pus, what we call otter ear, but also there's a red mass there, uh, a polyp, um, very deep in the ear, and it's very difficult to tell whether this is protruding from the eardrum or from the canal wall. Now, it would appear that this polyp is the root cause of all this discharge that's lying in the ear canal, so it's weeping, it's wet, and it's screwed in this discharge. So, of course, this patient has been referred to ENT. Um, now, I did share this video with an ENT colleague of mine just to get their opinion because one of the things, obviously, that comes to mind is whether it's a cholesteatoma. So a cholesteatoma is a, a, a skin cyst full of dead um, epidermal skin that's filled with keratin. And it normally forms um, a middle ear cholesteatoma on, in the case of this, the right ear, about 10, 11 o'clock. We call that the posterior superior quadrant. That part of the eardrum is more flaccid than the rest of the eardrum or the, the, the main body of the eardrum, the pars tensor. So the top section of the eardrum, called the pars flaccida, and a bit more um, uh, around 9, 10 o'clock even. So a bit of the pars tensor, if you like. That's also quite flaccid, the, the, the eardrum, so it's more elastic. And what that actually means is this, if you've got negative pressure behind the eardrum due to a blocked eustachian tube, for example, so the eustachian tube is the pressure equalising tube in the ear that connects the middle ear to the back of the nose. If that gets blocked, there's um, no air in the middle ear cavity, so your eardrum gets sucked in. And because the pars flaccida and the posterior superior quadrant of the eardrum is more flaccid, it's those regions that get sucked in first. And when they get sucked in, what happens is skin that's lining the eardrum, because the outer layer of the eardrum is the same skin that lines the bony part of the ear canal, the epidermal layer. And in fact, the skin that lines the bony part of the ear canal, it all originates from this very centre of the eardrum, the umbo region. Um, 
So when the skin cells are produced at the umbo, the centre of the eardrum, they radially migrate. And as the skin cells are migrating, if you've got a retraction pocket, the skin migrates into the retraction pocket. So instead of coming out of the ear, the skin, towards the entrance, it's getting trapped in the retraction pocket. If anything, it's going inwards, it's going the wrong direction. And a cyst forms, and the cyst obviously releases enzymes, proteolytic lysosomal enzymes, which basically start digesting flesh and bone, um, anything in its track, really. And you get keratin deposits as well, and you get bacteria feeding on it, which also releases these destructive proteolytic enzymes. And very quickly, it can become very dangerous because it can grow upwards towards the brain, uh, potentially creating rates creating a, uh, and causing a brain abscess or meningitis. It can grow backwards into the mastoid cavity, giving you uh, uh, mastoiditis, an infection of the mastoid bone. It can grow inwards further. It can damage, therefore, the, the ossicles, the three middle ear bones, the balance organ, the semicircular canals, uh, the facial nerve. So uh, potentially it can, it can lead to death. So whenever we see anything like this near the eardrum, of course, uh, we need to act uh, appropriately and swiftly and we've done the referral already to ENT. But is it a cholesterol Um We don't know. Um, the ENT consultant I spoke to, I said, again, they need to do further tests and assessments, CT scan. But it's not your, it's not originating, it doesn't appear that it's originating from the normal region, but sometimes appearances can be deceptive. It's, in the, it's almost overlapping the front part of the, the eardrum and the posterior part and there's one part that looks like it's growing protruding from the top right of the ear canal so if it's coming from the out if it's protruding from the ear canal itself then you can be pretty sure especially on the right hand side that it's not the cleshiotoma but again uh, this is a case for now for ENT and uh, I've asked the patient to update me and no doubt uh, the patient is going to see a colleague of mine more local and they'll no doubt get in contact with me and update me as well so it'll be interesting to see what's going on. And I will, of course, keep you guys updated. So for the rest of this video, what you're going to see me do is just remove all this residual uh, infected skin, uh, discharge that's crystallized, any wax, all from the perimeter of the ear canal. And I'm also just going to mop up as much as I can around the eardrum uh, to get much of this discharge out. I've asked this patient to try and get... I've, I've written to the GP requesting an urgent referral to ENT on the NHS, but... I just don't know how quickly they're going to be, be able to be seen. So, um, so this patient uh, has asked whether I can recommend someone privately, which I have. Uh, I've given a few, couple of names. And I've just asked them to, if they're going to go private, to go as soon as possible, really, because you know we've cleaned the ear out and this pus is just going to keep coming back. Um, in the meantime, I've asked the GP to, to prescribe some topical antibiotics and that's going to be more appropriate. Now, we don't know if there's a hole behind the eardrum, um, is this pus coming from behind there? Is there a hole because of this polyp? We don't know. So, but you can have some non-ototoxic topical medication and you can use um, antifungal drops as well because there is some fungi here. So I've left that with the GP as well and asked him to prescribe some medication whilst this patient's waiting to be seen by ENT. Uh, the patient's fully aware not to get any water in the ear because that will just only exacerbate this infection. So we're on the posterior part of the eardrum. I'm just going to start peeling some of this away. And we've got to be so gentle. When we're working on the bony part, any part of your ear is sensitive, but particularly the bony part. And I'm just trying to give you guys an example so you can relate to it. So unless you've had your bony part of the ear canal poked and prodded, you probably don't fully appreciate how painful it can be. But imagine if you, if you knock into uh, your shins into, I don't know, the side of a door or something sharp-edged, that really acute pain, or you've got some dental problems, you've got an experience, nerve in your in one of your teeth and you have some cold water or an ice cream or uh, an ice cube in, um, that really sudden acute pain that's what it can feel like when you poke the bony part of the ear canal that that's the sensitivity level um, because the bony part of the ear canal there's no there's no muscle on top of there there's there's no fatty tissue there's no dermis layer you've literally got skin and bone and that skin is just the epidermal layer the skin the outermost layer which is like 0.1 millimeters in thickness so we're going to be really really gentle now guys whilst you're watching this i just want to give you a quick update on what's going on um, with earwax movement in the uk many of you are aware that last year probably october november time uh, i started a big awareness campaign uh, about what's going on with earwax removal and the lack of regulation and 
um, what some high street companies were doing. Not only high street companies, independent companies as well. That some of them are just as guilty. Uh, and one professional uh, membership body who were trying to almost give some uh, legitimacy for lay people when it comes to ears and getting trained to perform earwax removal. Um, so when I say lay people, I don't want to be misquoted. I'm saying lay people when it comes to ears. I'm a lay person when it comes to eyes, to teeth. Uh, I'm not a dentist. I'm not an optician. So that I would classify myself as a lay person. Um, so um, anyone who's not got any formal experience or training, uh, clinical experience and training in ears, is a lay person. Uh, it's quite straightforward. So therefore, they shouldn't really be performing earwax removal um, unless they get some really thorough in-depth training and that's not going to happen after a couple of days guys so um, I spoke out about this because it was just getting ridiculous and uh, had a few battles on my hands as many of you know and gained a lot of traction not only from my colleagues within the audiological sphere but more important you guys because this is really for your benefit now just yesterday I had a friend of mine say Neil why are you fighting this campaign he used the phrase if you can't beat them why don't you join them and what he meant by that is that I could stand to profit from uh, the lack of regulation of earwax removal in the UK. And the reason why I can stand to, to benefit is because I train people. I, I do training classes and I haven't been doing them for a while and we're start, starting them next month because uh, I've been developing the wax gate. But that's what I do. I train people. So I manufacture devices that I can sell to people. I not only manufacture devices, I manufacture instruments to remove earwax. Uh, I've got a website where people can register and we charge um, advertising fees. So potentially I could become very, very rich very, very quickly, uh, especially because I have got a big platform. So I could basically advertise to everyone watching this video right now and make out that it's safe for anyone to do this and come on my training course. Um, so a friend was obviously knew the answer. I would never do that. But he just said, like, you know, <laughs> it, just, it was just a passing thought. And... So when I'm campaigning and speaking out against this, it's not because I'm trying to profiteer. In fact, it's the opposite. I'm, I'm losing, I could be losing potential revenue. Um, and the lay people who are performing ear action, well, then I don't see them as competition myself because, I mean, I see a different um, kind of complex, complexity of cases. Um, uh, so a lot of these cases are referred to me from other specialists uh, or they have been elsewhere and they, the patient realises that they've got really complex ears and they come to me for treatment. So... I'm not even, you know, being affected. Uh, my business is not being affected at all. I, I know that's not the case amongst some of my colleagues because um, when you've got, obviously, so many people doing it, it's going to be less... Uh, and I, I've, I've reassured them because eventually customers that you may have lost to some of these lay people because they're advertising it a lot cheaper, of course, they're going to come back to you. And that's happening. It's happening. A lot of the lay people are stopping as well because they, they realise this is not something that can just be done on a whim. And they're finding it really difficult. I've had... Um, I don't know if I've shared it, I've had a couple of nurses and pharmacists contact me for help and advice because they're like, we've spent all this money to get trained and it's really, really difficult um, and they're struggling to do it. So basically the professional membership body withdrew their guidelines uh, or paused it, should I say, and there was also uh, an emergency national DWAX agency group that was formed. So this group was... Um, it, were, it contained relevant key stakeholders uh, who have got a clinical interest in ears and an obligation to safeguard the public. So that uh, involved ENT UK, which is a professional membership body for ENT surgeons, uh, the British Society of Autology, I think, as well, if I'm not mistaken, who, again, another professional body for ENT surgeons, uh, the British Society of Audiology, so for audiologists, the British Academy of Audiology, as is another one, um, Another one is AHIT, which is an, uh, more of an independent audiologist in the UK. Then you had, it's not just audiologists that perform your work. So you've got nurses, so you've got the nursing and the periphery council, the NMC, uh, doctors, so the GMC. Then there were some charitable groups, the Royal National Institute for the Deaf. And they all came together. And I apologise if I missed any anyone off that list. It's not exhaustive. And because of all the campaigning that I was doing, they all came together and said we need to do something uh, we need to uh, we need to 
get earwax removal regulated. We need some standards. So they have been working busy in the background and hopefully they're going to be issuing a statement very, very shortly about what's been going on. And I think we're going to be starting a petition, uh, uh, which I'm going to be supporting and I hope everyone can get behind it to lobby government to make earwax removal a regulated activity. Anyway, so that brings us on to two days ago. So for the last 12 months um, in some parts of London, there was a pilot scheme being uh, performed whereby if you are an adult and you don't present with any red flag symptoms that definitely need um, onwards referral to, or seen by a GP or an ENT doctor, uh, if you have hearing problems or suspected wax problems, you can contact your GP and they would offer you the opportunity to be treated in a pharmacy. Uh, so have your ears checked, questioned, and any earwax remove, removed and a hearing screening performed. Um, and so the results of this pilot scheme were published a few days ago and it's quite alarming if, I, if I'm honest, but obviously the relevant key stakeholders who, who, who seek to profit from this have put a spin on it and making out that it's great uh, evidence-based to support what they're doing, which is basically training not only pharmacists who are clinicians, uh, pharmacy technicians, but also non-registered and non-clinical pharmacy staff, such as pharmacy assistants. And that's now in black and white. So, you know, if anyone doubted me and um, felt that I wasn't being truthful, this is in this report. They've openly said that... um, as part of this pilot scheme, patients can be treated and were in fact treated by non-registered and non-clinical staff. What's worrying though is that although the patients who agreed uh, to consent, so the patient doing the GP practice, the surgery will triage them, ask them some questions to see if they're suitable for the pilot scheme and then give them the opportunity to be seen by a pharmacy. I don't think they were told that potentially they would be seen by a pharmacy assistant. It doesn't stipulate that in the report. So that's the worrying thing uh, initially. The next glaring omission from this report is, although that they said 7,300, I think, people there or thereabouts, patients were referred to this pilot scheme, they didn't give any numbers of the patient number of patients who declined it. And that's really important. If you're going to roll this out nationally, you want to know the uptake of how many patients accepted this referral on the basis that we're going to see by a pharmacist. And I don't, again, think they were told the full truth that they may also be seen by a pharmacy assistant, which I suspect the acceptance rates would have been far lower. But how many people declined? And it doesn't stipulate that on the evaluation report. I mean, 79 pages, so I might have missed it, but I don't think I have. So, But that's crucial because if you've only got an uptake of 5% on this pilot scheme, well, the answer is there. It's a non-starter. So that's been admitted from as far as I know. So um, out of the 7,200-odd, I think 1,000, or maybe 2,000, I think it was, yeah, just short of 2,000, uh, the referrals were declined by the pharmacist because it, they felt it didn't meet the referral criteria. So in essence, about 5,300 people were seen by pharmacists in the end over a 12 month period. And um, this evaluation report deems this pilot to be a success based on the feedback provided, provided by 12% of those 5,300 um, odd people. So only 12% actually provided feedback. So 88% of people didn't provide feedback. But they still deemed it to be a success because of the 12%, apparently a lot of the feedback was positive. Now, because it's a community-based pilot scheme, is it possible that this 12% were people who were friends and family of the participating pharmacist because it was open to the public and they were the ones that were bothered in the end to provide feedback? We don't know, but that's a possibility. Um, So, now, out of the 5,300 people... 4,300-odd had microsuction been performed. But incredibly, um, a quarter, almost a quarter of patients were asked to come back on a follow-up. And this is despite the patients prior to attending the appointment being advised to put drops in their ears, whether they had earwax or not, because they were being triaged over the phone. Uh, they don't think they had their ears examined by the GP practice. To use drops for the ears for 10 to 14 days. So despite using drops for 10 to 14 days, these patients then presented to the pharmacy, and 4,300 had earwax removal performed, or micro attempted performance, about a thousand, so a quarter, almost a quarter, were uh, flagged as follow-ups. 
Now, I suspect that number is higher. And the reason why I say that is because pharmacists were not getting, obviously they were getting paid for all these appointments, but they weren't getting paid for follow-ups. So any pharmacy to arrange a follow-up, and kudos to them, really kudos to them. They're doing it off their own back, off their own resources. But not all pharmacy would do that. So not all pharmacists would even give a follow-up appointment. So that quarter of patients that have for follow-ups, I think that number is far, far higher. And the patients are just discharged because what was the, the incentive for the for some pharmacists to get these patients back? Because they weren't getting paid for it. And in fact, it was costing them money. So about a thousand patients were invited back for follow-ups. And incredibly, two thirds of those, about 650, didn't turn up. So what happened to these 650? Where did they go? So more people didn't attend their follow-up appointment than the number of people that actually voted on the survey. Are these 650 people patients who had such a bad experience at their first appointment that they didn't even bother going back for the second one and they went privately and saw another specialist because there's a lot of my colleagues around London who are seeing a number of patients who have been seen by uh, pharmacists uh, before now but also this evaluation report uh, makes the bold claim that there's no evidence that any harm was come to patients who were treated by non-registered professionals how would you know because 88 percent of people didn't even complete the survey. So that's uh, a bold statement to make. Uh, and what's also worrying is there was no um, validation check. So if I was going to do a pilot scheme like this to see if it's viable, it, I would want at least 20% of patients being seen by uh, pharmacists and their pharmacy assistants to be reviewed by an audiologist or ENT immediately afterwards, just to make sure that the treatment provided and the care plan provided was appropriate. But there was none of that. So... Um, this, basically, this pilot scheme was uh, reliant upon the clinical um, judgment of non-registered, non-clinical staff um, to be given the right treatment. There was no validation of whether what they were doing was correct, which is extremely worrying. Um, furthermore, the pilot um, report suggests that potential savings up to £50 pound, um, were made using this pilot referral route. Um, so it saved, because it saved the patient being seen by the GP or uh, being referred onwards to the hospital for treatment, it saved about 50 pound per patient. But they didn't factor in, from what the report suggests, the, the follow-up rate. Because if this is being rolled out nationally, although during the pilot scheme, pharmacists were d seeing these patients off their own back as a follow-up, well, that's not gonna be the case if this is nationally incorporated. Because pharmacists will need to get, and rightly so, paid for um, any follow-ups because it's their time and resources. So when you factor in the number of follow-up appointments, I very much doubt that there's any cost savings. In fact, I could argue that it actually costs more. And when I was reading the evaluation report, not many pharmacists who took part in this pilot scheme actually even gave feedback themselves. They, they, were, they just didn't feed back. They weren't, they didn't, many of them didn't complete the survey. But the ones that did, there was a few comments that... The level of money they funding they're getting for this pilot scheme it's not enough. It's so, um, and the other problem is if pharmacists were getting paid for follow ups, well, there's ethical issues there. Who's to say that you know some pharmacists keep getting patients back in for follow ups because they're getting paid? So it it raises a whole host of questions. So guys, what's your thoughts? Do you think this pilot scheme was great? Uh, do you think it was a success? Because this, some of the stakeholders believe so. I'd love to hear your thoughts.